when no, when I worked in uh, corporate consulting. Oh, okay. Um, and but the crazy thing is, the, bank, the Dallas office wasn't even. I mean, we have other stuff there, but the Dallas office wasn't enough to serve AT&T. So somebody from the New York AT&T would always be rotating down to Dallas. So if there were five people on a team, there would be five for the location, where you just have to spend one out of every five weeks in house. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Oh, hell yeah. Wait. Oh, no, I can't go in. Financial statement analysis. Uh, 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 yeah, I'm just going to draft a video of it. I'm going to repeat it. I'm yeah, I don't know if I can sit back here. No. Yeah, this is a problem. Well, I, from this one, I'm going to have the slides put on my computer. Yeah. I just had to be done a third party to kind of show us that was really cool. Yeah. I'm going to stick with the back row, but if it gets bad, we might have to abandon this side. We'll try it for an hour. Whatever, bro. You don't like this? No, I guess just saying. How's the weekend, Brian? Oh, yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Good seeing everybody. Yeah, it's actually really nice to see you. Did your girl go with you? No, I just wanted to think of that. Are you guys going to see the Chinese New Year party?
population, and we know you have schizophrenia, and you can imagine that for that segment of the population, I'm going to give this test to these 20 people that I know for sure, maybe I should say 200, 20 is probably not too large, 200 people that I know for sure have schizophrenia, I'm going to look at their brain, I'm going to decide if it's atrophy, and I'm going to tell you that, oh, you know, like 50% of these people, it's, it's atrophy. Now, there's also a lot of people that I know don't have schizophrenia. Okay? So, there's people I know for sure don't have schizophrenia. I, I, can, I can look at their brain, I, I can see whether or not it's atrophied, I can give them this CAT scan, I can see whether or not the brain's atrophied, and it turns out that it's a really small percentage that, of, quote, normal people whose brain are atrophied. So you can imagine that those are two statistics that doctors and scientists can get at, they can measure, there's not any um, question about them. And so the defense attorney's argument is that, well, because so many schizophrenics have atrophied brains, and so many non-schizophrenics are not showing atrophy in the brain, I'm going to show you a picture of Hinkley's brain, and it's atrophied. And so that seems like that really suggests it's quite likely that he has schizophrenia. So this is, a, this is kind of conditional probability, because what I'm telling you is I'm telling you percentages about given you know somebody has schizophrenia, or given you know somebody doesn't have schizophrenia, whether or not their brain is showing up. But if you're on that jury, or if you're the prosecutor, if you're the expert consulting for the prosecutor to tell them how to counter this argument, you're thinking, well, well, what am I seeing? I'm seeing an atrophied brain. So I know for sure that there's atrophy in this brain. And what I know, want to know is the frequency of time that an atrophied brain ends up being schizophrenic versus non-schizophrenic. And there's no way for me to actually have that information, right? Because I, I don't think any of us can say with absolute certainty that get Hinkley is schizophrenic or non-schizophrenic. So now the question is, how do we interpret the statistics that we can collect, but that aren't exactly the way we want to know them, in the way we want to know them, which is for this particular case, is it reasonable that he was schizophrenic and maybe should be given some extra consideration. Okay, so that's a conditional probability problem. And, uh, oh, and, you know, I didn't know this, but uh, somebody last class said he, in September, he was actually just let out of prison. So, yeah. so this is a little bit relevant to uh, recent events. And so the concepts we need for answering this question are really, we need rules for calculating probability of one event from, it, from the other, because I'm talking about whether or not Hinkley is schizophrenic, and, I'm, and I know he has atrophy in the brain, so there are these two different events. There's events about schizophrenia, there's events about atrophy. So I need to know how to go between probabilities of one event to probabilities of another event. And I need to, to know something about this condition, because the probabilities I'm giving you are probabilities not for everybody in the population. I'm giving you probabilities for people that this segment of the population that have schizophrenia. So what I want to do in this class is really, first I want to spend sort of the first half of class putting that in formalisms. So uh, I'll, I'll do my warning. Hopefully that, that was an entertaining five minutes, because I, the, the next bit is going to be a little bit dry, because I want to give you some formal definitions of set theory and how do we combine events and probabilities. And then I want to come back to the problem and say, OK, so now you have sort of the formal tools you need. Let's go ahead and, and do this calculation. Uh, oh, and I also have a note is the homework two is posted. It's due a week from Wednesday by 11 AM. And um, I have a book with me, so if you want to just come up and take a picture, if you don't have the book, please feel free to do that after class. And because I'll forget to say it, the other thing I want to say is um, if you take a picture of the book, make sure that for exercise 3.3, you need example 3.3. So make sure you actually take a picture of both page 186 and page 187, because otherwise you're going to say, uh-oh, I'm missing like about three lines that I need. Okay, so basically I, I want to go over some formalisms and it'll be a little bit abstract, um, but hopefully not too much. Um, and remember our purpose is eventually to solve this simply. And I'm not going to say anything about random variables in this class, I'm really going to talk about events. But before I move completely away from random variables, I want to remind you that there's this connection between random variables and events, so it doesn't seem like I'm 
going off into outer space. So. so we have a sample space. I tossed two die. I have a sample space. There's 36 points in it representing the outcome of die one and the outcome of die two. And my random variable is the sum of them. So if I want to ask you about the probability this random variable takes on a seven, that is the event that corresponds to any of these possibilities in the sample space. These are the possibilities in the sample space where the numbers add to seven. So the event is this diagonal line in the sample space. And I would say that's probability of a six because there's 36 points in the sample space. There's six different outcomes. There's six different things in the sample space. And so just think of the random variable. I'm reminding you that the random variable is a mapping from points in the sample space to the real line. And the event is, so if I'm, if I'm talking about events, that's the same thing as talking about random variables taking on particular numbers. And similarly, we don't always have a sample space with numbers. The random variable is always numbers. So if I toss two coins, I'll have a sample space that's uh, made up of heads and tails. So heads, heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, tails, tails. And maybe my random variable is the number of heads. So again, I'm mapping from this sample space to the real line. Okay, so my graphic illustration is I've got a sample space, random variable map from the sample space to the real line. The event is something that happens in the sample space, so I can also think of the random variable as mapping from an event to the real line. Just like here, this event consisted of six different points in the sample space. And the random variable corresponding to that event was 7. Okay, so that's the last thing I'm going to say about random variables. I'm only, only going to talk about events. I just didn't want you to think that that wasn't relevant because there's a connection between if I'm calculating probabilities of events, that's the same thing as calculating probabilities that random variables are taking on certain values. Alright, so now for events. And if I'm going to talk about how to calculate events, I, I, I want a little bit of language, I'll call it set theory, or it is set theory. I want a little bit of language of how I look at different points, how I combine different points, how I add and subtract different points. So that's going to help me in calculating probabilities of different events. And what I'm going for is, it, eventually what I'm going for is, if you think about the Hinkley problem, one thing you have a lot of times is the statistics that are easy for you to measure for particular events may or may not correspond to information you want to know. So a lot of times we're in this situation where we want to get to and from statistics we can easily measure to combinations of events that are sort of more relevant for us. So that's what I want to know. So here's my sample space. I've got 18 points in this sample space. Abstract sample space. I warned you there'd be a little bit of abstract formalism. When I say outcome, it's any point in this sample space. Or any point in any sample space. It doesn't have to be this one. I'm just trying to give you a representation. A subset of the sample space is an event. So an event is a collection of the outcomes in the sample space. The entire sample space itself is an event. And I'm going to distinguish between, if I want to make sure the event doesn't include everything in the sample space, this symbol is a proper subset, meaning it can't include everything. This symbol is just a subset, meaning it may or may not include everything. So if E here is a subset of S with that lower line, it means E could actually be equal to the sample space itself. If I don't have that lower line, I'm distinguishing from the fact that E is some uh, set of points in the sample space, but it's not every single point in the sample space. Okay, so that's just notation. Sometimes it helps me to have notation for uh, a set that doesn't contain any elements. So that's called the null set, and that's just the set that doesn't have anything in it. It's also called the empty set, which is maybe a bit more involved. Okay, now I said I'm, I'm sometimes in the, this position where uh, events that I know about are not actually the ones I care about, so I want to be able to, I'll say, create new events from old. And one operation here is union. So here I've got two events. A is in the blue. It's 2, 3, 8, and 9. Uh, green is the B. It's 3 and 4. And if I take their union, it is every element
dependent in either A or B. So the union by this symbol, this kind of U symbol, is 2, 3, 4, 8, 9. And it's itself a sub seven set. Another common one is intersection. So I have A, I have B, and I want the elements that are common to both. So the intersection, the upside down U, is elements common to both, and that's just three. And it's actually a lot of times abbreviated where you'll see people just write A, B, and not include the symbol at all. And so if you see that, that means intersection. Let's say uh, the, the B set was where you had it before, it was 3 and 4 rather than 2 and 3. Um, if you were to subtract B from A in that particular situation, would that be a legal operation? 2, 8, 9. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, so legal operation, and you would just only subtract the elements that are That in are actually, yeah. So maybe I should think of it as subtracting A minus A intersection B. And complement, so if A is 2, 3, 8, and 9, and I say complement, I, I will try to be consistent, but I probably won't be consistent. Sometimes it's written with a subscript C. Sometimes it's written with an overhead line. It means every element that's not in A. So these are all the elements in the sample space that aren't in A. What is A intersection A complement? Null set. Okay, so they don't have any elements in complement. The null set of empty set. And what is A union A complement? The entire sample space. Right. So A union A complement is A. Disjoint sets. So the disjoint sets means they don't have any elements in common. So here's A, here's B. Their intersection is the null set. There's no element that's in both. Partition, it's useful to help me to say partition. If I say partition, what it means is I've got a collection of sets or events. Their union is the entire sample space. So together they include everything that could be in that sample space. But none of them have any elements in common. So any two of these events or subsets are completely disjoint. Their intersection is the null set. So it's, it's quite useful for me to have the concept of partition sometimes. So this is partition. And there's three axioms of probability. And actually, everything in probability is derived from these three axioms. So um, what are they? So the first axiom is probabilities are between 0 and 1. So I don't. So if you ever have a probability that comes out to be negative or greater than 1, Something's not working. And I thought I would just relate this axiom to uh, what we did with on the first day of class when we did the investing example and we did the count ifs. So let's think about these uh, axioms in terms of the count if statement. And that's basically what we did there was a relative frequency interpretation. So we had this experiment in the first lecture. We were interested in the event that stocks outperformed the risk-free investment, say it returned 10%. And to estimate that probability, we counted the number of times the stock return exceeded 10%, and we divided by the number of experiment repetitions. So this was this count if Excel command. Okay. And so that was the relative frequency of times we saw outcomes that were less than 10%. And there were 88 points in those observations, so that statement should have always given you a number between 0 and 1. This says the probability of the entire sample space is 1. And notice, you know, the maximum return we saw was less than 50% in that sample space. So if I tried to count all the returns that were less than 53%, that would be 88 of them. I'm including everything. And in fact, that calculation gives me 1. And the last is the probabilities of disjoint events add. 
So we've sort of seen this before. So if I have the union here of two disjoint events, meaning E1 and E2 have nothing in common, then I can just add their probabilities. And we can also see this in a count if statement, in the sense that if I ask you for what's the frequency of times that I see returns either less than 10 or greater than 0.45, well, if you want to count that number, your numerator is the sum of these count if statements. And that clearly separates into the frequency of times we see returns less than 10% plus the frequency of times we see returns greater than 45%. But if these weren't disjoint, that would clearly break down. If I ask you for to count the number of times you see returns less than 10% or greater than zero, then I, I can't just suddenly break that down into summing things because I would be double counting the number of times I see returns between zero and 10. So to do this operation, just be aware that you have to make sure you have something that's disjoint. There can't be any overlap. Okay, so a little bit more calculating <coughs> probabilities. If you have a partition of your sample space, we know the entire sample space equals one. I'm adding up disjoint events, so this should all be one. So the probability of the union of all this is one. And the union is over these disjoint events, so that's why I can represent the purpose. This also tells me that if I tell you the probability of the event, and I want the probability of the complement of that event, I just need to do 1 minus the probability. Probability is always summed to 1. Partition is always summed to 1. A and A complement are always a partition of the sample space. two events here, A and B. I figured out probabilities of A and B, but I want to know the probability of A union B. So if they're uh, independent and multiply. Do I multiply for union? Oh, not union, sorry, I was thinking intersection. Yes, okay, so I totally union. agree. Intersection, I would agree. Union, I don't multiply. You... But actually, hang on to this for just a second, because I want to make one point before I actually ask this. I'm doing things out of order. Um, I just said the probability A was 0.35 and the probability of B was 0.10. And if I counted the number of elements in B, it's two elements, and there's 18 elements in my sample space. So I didn't give you 2 over 18 as the probability of B. Is that a problem? <coughs> Are my numbers inconsistent? Yes, yeah, no. Okay. So I never actually told you that all points in this sample space are equally likely. There's no reason not to think that uh, 1 comes up a ton and 18 doesn't come off very often at all. So this is a sample space where points aren't all equally likely, and the reason you know that is by looking at the probability of A and B. But, but then it's the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of the intersection. Yes. Okay, so what Paige just said, I've got the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the intersection. Now, why is that? So let's think about that. I want the probability of A union B. So I want the probability of 2, 3, 4, 8, 9. So when I get the probability of A, I've got 2, 3, 8, 9. When I get the probability of B, I've got 3 and 4. And I've added 3 twice. And because 3 is in both of them. So I need to subtract out that A, B, because I'm actually, anything that's in both of those sets, when I add the probability of A and the probability of B, I'm actually double counting them. Okay, so that's my formula, and you just want to remember, you subtract this out because you're double counting. And remember that axiom that said if everything was disjoint, it's just A plus B? Well, look, if I didn't have anything in that intersection, that probably would be zero. So if A and B were totally disjoint, I would just have the probability of A plus the probability of B. So this is totally consistent with what I gave you before. It's just that now we're like, uh-oh, now i got to take care of any intersections. Okay. The other thing that that's, turns out to be useful quite a bit of time is it's called law of total probability. And this is also like a partition, but it's a partition of an event. So here, I've got A. I want to know the probability of A, but I don't actually know the probability of A on its own. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to partition A, and I'm going to partition A by looking at A intersection B, so that's 3, A intersection C, so that's 9, and A intersection D, so that's 2 and 8. So if I want to calculate the probability of A, and I can find an, a relevant partition of this set A, not the entire sample space, but just this subset A, then I can calculate the probability of A by adding up the probability of A intersection B plus the probability of A intersection C plus the probability of A intersection D. And you notice there's no double counting because I've specifically made this a partition so that there's no, you know, two isn't in this one and that. Okay, so that was quite a bit of formula, so I tried to give you one slide that we kind of just gave you a recap of everything. Probabilities between 0 and 1. We've got a formula for union. If everything's disjoint, so mutually ex exclusive means that if I take the intersection of any of these two events, nothing is in common, so all of these sets are disjoint, then the probability of their union just adds. So in particular, anytime you have a position, you can add. And also, anytime you have a partition, that means you, their union is the whole sample space. So anytime you have a partition, the probability of the union should equal one. If you have complementary events, I never have to give you, if I give you the probability of the event, the probability of its complement has to be 1 minus the probability of B. And if you have mutually exclusive and exhaustive events, so you have a partition of the sample space, I can calculate the probability of A as the sum of the probability of A intersection B. And probably the most common to do this with is B and B complement form a partition. So if you take B1 as B and B2 as B complement, that's probably the most common way you're using this. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's basically formulisms on how to combine events. I still have to define conditional probability. So we still need to get to conditional probability. So let's spend a little bit more time on it. Okay, so conditional probability. So what does this mean? I'm tossing two die. 36 points in my sample space. What is the probability the sum of the die equals 6? Question to you. Yeah, I heard 536. Why did you say 536? Well, you said the, this event, that the sum of the die equals 6, consists of the points 5, 1, 4, 2, uh, 2, 3, and 1, 4. So, oh, 6, sorry, I can't add. <laughs> 1, 5, 2, 4, 3, 3, 4, 2, and 5, 1. So that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 points. It's 5 points, and this sample space, they're all equally likely, so that's 5 over 36. And if you ever have to make die calculations in your life, notice that this table, um, whenever you want sums, the sum is always arranged on a diagonal. So it makes making these calculations nice. Okay, so now I'm going to update the information, right? We said the probability of the sum of the die equals 6 is 5 over 36. I've already forgotten. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 over 36. But I'm going to give you some more information. The first die is a 4. So now, conditional on that first die being a 4, meaning you have this information, what are you going to tell me in terms of the probability of the sum equals 6? 1, 6. One, six. And why did you do that? You said, well, if you tell me the first die equals 4, I am no longer considering the entire sample space. I am only considering this bit that corresponds to the event that first die was 4. So I'm restricting my sample space. And how many ways are there to get 6 now? Well, there's exactly one way to get 6. It's this one. And so one way to think about this is what I'm doing is the probability of A given B. It's the probability of the intersection divided by the probability of B. So I'm renormalizing the sample space. The sample space is no longer all of these 36 points. The sample space is just these 6 points. That's my B event, where the first die was 4. And what do I care about? I care about the intersection of where the sum is 6 and I have a 4. So that's my AB, 
And my AB is this 4, 2. And if I calculated this based on the entire sample space, AB has it's 1 point, 1 over 36. B is 6 points, it's this entire row, so that's 6 over 36, and I get 1 6, which is exactly what you told me it did. So this is a general formula, it's always true, it's the way to think about conditional probability, and this way you thought about it with the die is exactly right. When I ask you for a conditional probability, what I'm doing here is I have an entire sample space, I'm telling you, let's say, that B occurs. So once I tell you that B occurs, I am restricting this sample space to only, this, only B. I don't care about anything else. So if I want the probability of A given B, I need to look at, within B, how many times do I also see A? So now when I calculate the probability, I'm looking at the probability of A, B, and I'm normalizing by how much of that sample space does B take. Okay, so that's your definition of conditional probability, and what you're doing is I'm giving you information, and once I give you information, you want to update your calculations. So I mentioned something about independence uh, on Wednesday. Now I can formally tell you what independence is. So independence means that probability of A given B is exactly equal to the probability of A. So this says that I may that B tells me nothing about A. And the prototypical example is I roll two six-sided die. I'm not interested in their sum. And if I tell you the first die is a one, that gives you absolutely no information on what the second die is. So that's independent, and it, it doesn't help me. The probability of the second die being a one is a six, whether or not I tell you about the first one. So those two should be. And if you look at this formula, I said something about probabilities multiplying when they're independent. So this is exactly where it comes from, that probabilities multiply when they're independent. So if probability of A given B is exactly equal to the probability of A, then that tells me the probability of A, sorry, A given B, A intersection B is going to be probability of A times probability B when they're independent. If they're not independent, you have to worry about what that condition means. But if they are independent, you just get to multiply. And I thought it's good to look at a graphic illustration of this, too. So, uh, oh, no, actually, I have it on, sorry. So I posted an Excel file. And if you want to look at it together, it's return data. And I'm going to go through to example one. And I kind of already did... Uh, everything for you, just so we can all look at the same pictures. So I have two investments. You can think of them as stock prices, and every day I've calculated the return, so the, <coughs> the, the change in price. And what I've done is here, I've given you a scatter plot of the return of investment one versus the return of investment two. This is what independence looks like. This is like a shotgun pattern. There's, it's, there's not really any, there's not really any pattern. It's just kind of a random spread. On the other hand, if I look at example two, and I do the plot, you notice that if investment one is higher, that tells you that investment two return also tends to be higher. So this is an example of dependence. Because it's quite clear that if I tell you something about investment one, that gives you information on investment two. If I tell you investment one is high, investment two is likely to be high. On the other hand, if I look at this example, if I tell you investment one is likely to be high, investment two is all over the place. That doesn't say anything. One measure of independence or dependence, if I have independent events, your correlation function in Excel should be zero. So you can see this. And um, it's Corel, so equals C-O-R-R-E-L. It's a measure of sort of strength of uh, dependence. 
and I'm saying equals Corel, it should always be between, be between negative 1 and 1. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but since I was guessing some of you are familiar with it, I just wanted to associate the function with the plot you're seeing. And I'm looking at array 1, so that's my investment 1, comma, now I'll look at investment 2. And so you can see that that but function comes back as something very close to zero. So whenever Corel comes back as something very close to zero, your scatter plot should look like that. That suggests to you that you have independent. Is there a cutoff for dependent? There's not an exact cutoff. Zero, I mean, technically, that is dependent because it's not zero. But I, I think since there's a little bit of messiness and you're never going to get exactly zero. But I would probably start worrying when it gets, certainly when it gets to point 0.1. <laughs> Below point 0.5 is probably okay. And one thing I pointed out is what I showed you for dependent was a linear relationship. It, it was a line. But if I'd drawn a circle, if I'd drawn a circle, it would still be dependent because if I told you, if I told you what investment 1 was, you would know investment 2 was somewhere on that circle. However, your Corel function would, would probably come back, it would come back as zero. It wouldn't, okay? So just the word of caution, independence implies your Corel function is going to be zero. Your Corel function being zero does not necessarily imply independence. So the, the connection is actually only one way. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, but um, I, I didn't I wanted to make sure I was saying you know, everything correct. Okay, so now I want to give you an example problem. So this is kind of your first translation from a little bit of the abstract stuff to where all this stuff is coming into play. And let's suppose you have two factories. And there are only two factories in this universe. And each make an identical product. First factory has a 90% yield, and the second factory has an 85% yield. And your first factory is making 40% of your total product, your second factory is making 60%. I want to know the probability one of your products has a defect. So you're the manager. There are two factories under your control. You can definitely imagine it's quite easy to know the defect rate of factory one. You have uh, quality control people there. They're checking it. Same thing for factory two. And you know how much yield each factory is giving. And now you want to translate that knowledge into What's the frequency of times you're giving your customers a product with a defect? That seems important. But if you think about it, um, the easiest, the information you have available is not exactly that information. Okay, so how would we do that? So how do I visualize this? I have this sample space. There are two factories in my universe. You're responsible for two factories. They're both producing defects. And... How do I calculate this probability of a defect? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is this law of total probability. So this law of total probability says if I want to calculate the probability of a defect, I want to calculate the probability of the defect intersection F1 plus the probability of the defect intersection F2. So F1 and F2 are basically partitioning this event defect. There's nothing else that can happen. I don't have a third factory. So if I have a defect, it either came from F1 or it came from F2. Now I'm going to use the definition of conditional probability. The definition of conditional probability lets me get from intersection to a conditional probability. So if I want D intersection F1, that's the same thing as D given F1 times F1 plus probably of D given F2 times probably of F2. And now this is all information I have. So factory 1, its yield is 90%, so that means 10% of the time it's producing defects and 40% of my total production is coming from F1. For factory two, it tells me its yield is 85%, so 15% of the time it's uh, producing defects. And 60% of that production is coming from F2. So there's the probability of the defect. So this is translating uh, some of these formula that I gave you on the conditioning and the intersection and the law of total probability into how does it mean for sort of numbers in a problem? I have a question. Um, so for that second line, 
I give you this CAT scan. 2% of the time you show activity, mm -hmm. and 98% of the time you don't. Okay. So, so John Henry wasn't well, schizophrenic when he said this. And that's, that's the question. <laughs> How are you going to argue that? Yeah. Okay. I see what you're okay. And the other one is if I know you're schizophrenic, 30% uh -huh. of the time that brain is going to show atrophy. Yeah. It's going to show atrophy. Okay. All right. That's interesting because even then, they, they mention that. In the trial that he was not when he shot him. Yeah, but. Oh, did you watch the trial? <laughs> no, I was actually. I, oh. I, I Googled it. I said, like. Oh, okay, and cool. Said, I wanted to see what they were saying versus what you're doing in like, oh, specific okay. ways. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, agreed. So it's not. But. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly what the standard is. Mm -hmm. It suggests that it's more likely he has schizophrenia than you. <laughs> care about. One event is whether or not the brain was atrophied. 
shows atrophy, and one event is whether or not uh, schizophrenia, you, you have schizophrenia. Showing us that the fact the numbers saying that yeah, by by the numbers we can we can we can re reduce that. Yes, he did, or he didn't. Have that. No, I think I'm showing you that you can really do that. Really, there's no way to truly prove that he was. Yeah. So, and so numbers seem more likely. We look at it like blind. It's more likely that he didn't have schizophrenia in the way. Right. So like he did, or he didn't. He, so just to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of the information okay, I've given you, so okay. I'm going to say a couple words and then I'm going to be quiet again for a few minutes. Uh -huh. Two events of interest. One event is whether or not a randomly chosen person suffers from schizophrenia. That's our S. The A is the event your the participant's CAT scan, CAT scan shows a brain atrophy. And what information are you given? You're given... What's the probability of S? 1.5%. So we know that there are 1.5% of the people in the population are schizophrenic. Okay. What else do I know? Given that you're schizophrenic, the probability that your brain is going to show up as atrophied, what's that? 30%. And the other thing I know is, given you're not schizophrenic, so S complement, if I give you this count scan, what's the probability the brain is going to show up as atrophy? 
two per, uh, two percent, yeah. Okay, so that's the information you have to work with. And now we want to go from that information to what do you actually want to know? If you're the prosecutor, what do you want to tell the jury? What calculation do you want to tell them? The likely, so the likelihood that a random person would, with an atrophy, is. You said likelihood that a random person with an atrophy, so I'm not going to say that's quite a random person because yeah. you've told me the information yeah. that they have atrophy. Yeah. Uh -huh. But that's exactly what I want, right? Yeah. Here we yeah. are. I'm showing you this person, and the brain has atrophy in it. Uh -huh. And you want to know, so this is the information you have, and you want to know what's the probability that that person is actually schizophrenic given I should give you absolute incontroversial evidence that that brain is atrophy. So that's what you want to know. The above is the information you have. Okay. So let me give it just a few, a few more minutes in case you wanted a little help getting started. That's, uh, yeah. Hmm. And if you have finished part one, please start thinking about part two. Like, you know, like it's tricky. Yeah. It's more like this. Yeah. So they're more likely that they, they wouldn't have both things. They, they didn't have to have one or the other. Yeah, that's, it's just not for me. Oh, yeah, that's the other reason. Because the bottom is just not 
accountability of any given person. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's certainly enough to sow a reasonable doubt, I think. Mm. Mm. What else might you want to notice there is I'm going to erase this number for a second. And uh, if I just write out my little formula here, this thing equals probability of A given S times the probability of S. That's this. And up here, I've got probability of A given S times probability of S plus probability of A given S complement times probability of S complement. So if you go back to my slides, the next slide was Bayes' formula. And I did this afterwards because I didn't actually need to give you Bayes' formula for you to do this. I wanted you to sort of see what does it mean in terms of, you know, partitioning the population and restricting the population to atrophy. But you've actually figured out Bayes' formula for yourself. So Bayes' formula is, I'll call it a formula for flipping probabilities. And here, oh, this is terrible because S is A and B is A. But <laughs> if you can manage the sort of bad notation there, you can say that this is for any two general events A and B. And what we figured out when we derived that numerator and denominator is exactly what I'm giving you in Bayes' formula. So generally, when you do these types of problems, that's what you want. I usually don't remember Bayes, I remember the definition of conditional probability and that I work out what the numerator and the denominator needs to be. I said I wanted to do the problem two ways, that continues, so I would actually like to go back and do this problem a second way. And uh, I at least saw one of you doing it my second way in your Excel. So this is, if you want to kind of relate everything I'm saying to the formal calculations, this is how you relate it. If you want to think about it graphically, so if you're sort of familiar with decision, decision trees and you like mapping things out graphically, how do I see this graphically? So another way for me to think about the information I'm given is I start out and let's say I have a thousand Americans. Okay, okay so this is just a thousand people. I've randomly sampled them from the population. We'll assume there's no bias in my sampling. There's just a thousand people. There are two options for these thousand people. They either have schizophrenia or they don't. There's no in between. And we know that the probability of schizophrenia is 0.015, so that means that I expect 15 of these people to be schizophrenic. And equivalently, the ones that don't have schizophrenia, well, that's the rest of them, so that's uh, 1 minus 0.015, 0 0.985. So that is 985 are not schizophrenic. And you'll have to excuse my handwriting. So this says 15 schizophrenic, 985 not schizophrenic. So that's my, how my 1,000 Americans divide themselves. Now I'm going to further divide each of these populations. So your brain either has atrophy or it doesn't. Maybe you're schizophrenic. And now. Maybe your brain has atrophy. Maybe it doesn't have atrophy. And we had some information. We said, well, the probability that your atrophy, given your schizophrenic, is 0.3. So if I multiply 0.3 times 15, that is 4.5. And I'm not going to round up. We're going to assume we can have half a person. So that's like 4.5 people. I could have started with 10,000, and then I ended up with 45 there. So pretend I started with 10,000, we ended up with 45. And on the other hand, the probability that you don't have atrophy, given you're schizophrenic, so that was happening 70% of the time. Okay. So this says that about 10.5 of those people do not have atrophy, and I can make the same division on the other side. So here's the people that aren't schizophrenic, and they either have atrophy in the brain or they don't have atrophy in the brain. And the probability we had atrophy given we weren't schizophrenic. So this was what the defense's argument was resting on. This is a really small number, right? This was 0 0.02. That's 0 0.02. So if I do 2% times 985, I'm getting 19.7 with atrophy. And the probability I don't have atrophy given I'm not schizophrenic, well, that's pretty high. That is... 0.98, and so 0.98 times 985, that's 965.3 that do not have atrophy. So 
are you happy that I I started with a thousand Americans? I've subdivided, I've subdivided, and I've subdivided again, and now we've got every potential case that these thousand Americans could be in. Now, I'm interested in people that have atrophy, right? What I know, I'm not arguing with the defense attorney about this. This guy has atrophy, so I'm interested in this part of the population, right? And if I go back up my tree, well, okay, 4.5 are schizophrenic. So 4.5. And the portion, if I want to look at the proportion of those that are schizophrenic, it should be 4.5 divided by 4.5 plus 19.7. And oh my, that's about equal to a fifth. In fact, that's exactly the probability we just calculated. So this is the graphic illustration of what you're doing when you're doing Bayes' theorem. And uh, this, okay, so again, this illustrates the point that, okay, so it may seem like only 2% of the people are showing this atrophy, but... Just because you show atrophy, there's really only a 20% chance that you have schizophrenia, and there's an 80% chance that you don't. So for testing purposes, it should be more phase or this one? Either way. Perfectly happy for you to do either way. I, I try to do things two different ways so you can kind of decide which you like. And similarly for that one. So what about part two? Oh. Yeah, so for part two, the way that we just did it from the prosecution standpoint, we're saying if you have an atrophy, the chances of having schizophrenia are only 80%. <coughs> but if you reframe it for <coughs> the defense by saying if you're schizophrenic, you have a 15 times more likely than a non-schizophrenic person to be atrophy. I agree, but that's the defense's original argument. Yeah. The defense's oh, so original mean, argument is there's, it's 15 times more likely between this point. I know point three on its own doesn't look that high, but when I compare it to point zero two, it's really high. So, yes, except, <laughs> that's the original argument. Um, I think if I were the defense, I would just say, like, yeah, it's only 20% for like the general population who has an atrophied brain, but he also did a bunch of crazy stuff, and maybe these people aren't, with, uh, like most people with atrophied brains aren't doing this crazy stuff, so together this really like implies that he could be schizophrenic. So let me follow this on a little bit. I like this, which is, you know, I'm the defense attorney, and I say, well, it's not that I only showed you this cat scan. I introduced other evidence for Hinckley that suggests that he's schizophrenic. I had character witnesses. I don't know what else I had. I think some of you Googled this, so maybe you can tell me what else they had. So my first counter is exactly what you said, Paige, which is that was not my only evidence. Where does that come into the calculation? So I'm a technically-minded defense attorney, and I don't want to just say, okay, but I have more evidence. How do I put that into the calculation? <laughs>
behavioral references from friends, past history of his behavior, uh, stuff like that, has the exact same chance as Louis as being schizophrenic? A song, oh yeah, that seems a little bit weird to me. Hinkley's not the same as one person in this class. Hinkley, we got a history on, we've been studying his history, like, I don't accept that the prior on Hinkley should be that he has a 1.5% chance of being schizophrenic. I don't know how high it should go, but you've at least got to give me as a defense attorney that you don't start Hinkley off with the same place you start Louie off. So let's try something.
And your favorite basketball team has the following shooting percentages. 70% of a goal if you're shooting a free throw. Is that, I think that's pretty good, right? Free throws are usually made. 40% um, if it's just a normal shot. And uh, if it's a three-point shot, it's, it's less likely, so it's like 20%. Typical game, let's say 100 shots are taken, and they're divided as follows. 20 free throws, 60 normal shots, 23 pointers. So I don't watch basketball that much. Is that a reasonable breakdown? Okay, well, <laughs> we'll assume it is. So the first thing I want to do is let's estimate the number of points made by this team on three-point shots in a typical game.
So I've got G complement, and I want the probability of a free throw, free throw union three-point shot, because I said free throw or three-point shot, so that's, uh, that's union, it could be either one. I said disjoint events add, they continue to add when you're conditioning on something, nothing changes there. So this is the probability of F given, sorry, yeah, F given G complement plus the probability of T given G complement. And now both of these we have a fair bit of experience with. This is probability of F intersection G complement divided by probability of G complement plus probability of T intersection G complement divided by probability of G complement. G complement we know because we calculated G, so it's 0.58. For the numerators here, so I know probability of G complement given F, G complement given F times probability of F divided by probability of G complement plus probability of G complement given T times probability of T divided by probability of G complement. Oops, sorry about that. And now I can fill in the numbers. What's G complement given F? Point 0.3. I know that G given F is 0.7, so I'm minusing them. So that's 0 0.3. 1 minus 0.7 is 0.3. Probability of F, we know, is 0 0.2. Probability of G complement, then, is 1 minus 0.42. So that's 0.58. Plus, and so what's probability of G complement given T? 0.8, because it's 1 minus, why is this guy? So I got 0 0.8 times T, 20% of the time I'm T, so that's 0 0.2. Oh, did I get, yeah, Divided by G complement is 0 0.58, and I don't have the calculation done, so if one of you guys can tell me, that's great. 37.9. Uh, Point three seven nine three. Or point, point three seven, yeah. Point three seven. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so point three. Okay, so that was just a little practice in going from the words to what the conditioning information is. Okay, so then what was today? Today was uh, we had set theory to calculate probabilities, and then it was a lot of time spent on conditional probability and independence and their definitions and base theory. What's next time? So if you remember the case we did actually asked you about a continuous distribution of savings. I want to talk about continuous distributions on Wednesday. And if you want to copy the homework, uh, I've got the homework. Yeah. Uh, cool example. Yes. I, I didn't see it. Yeah. 